Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Kika Tuff. This is actually a very interesting podcast interview because actually she does not work in neural implants, neurobiology, uh, neural engineering, anything like this. She's actually an ecologist, trained, uh, finished her PhD in ecology, but now has become a science communicator. And so we talk about the importance of communication and science and why it's important to craft a good story, make a good website, make a documentary film about what you're doing and, and explain not only to the, you know, few other people that that like, you know, why certain birds chirp a certain way, but also to the wider world, explain to the public why you're doing what you're doing, what the broader impacts are, and why funding agencies should give you money. So I think this is really cool. And then stick around, you know, till the end, I am going to be announcing something. I'm announcing the launch of something very, very exciting. So uh, wait till the end, last few minutes, I'm uh, launching this in my conclusion of the episode. So very exciting stuff. And hopefully you you will learn something new in this interview. Kika, Kika Tuff or Kika Tuff or what are you? Kika uh, what Tuff. Are you Kika Tuff. Tuff, so Kika, uh, Dr. Tuff. Dr. Tuff, Dr. <laughs> Tuff. Uh, it's a tough doctor to have. <laughs> yeah. I bet I bet you heard that joke a bunch, huh? <laughs> I have, yeah. My students, when I was in grad school, loved, you know, the students don't know you don't get the title until after you graduate. So they just, the sweet ones anyway, just start calling you Dr. Tough from the beginning. And um, I love the sound of it. So anyways, you run Impact Media Lab, which is kind of a storytelling platform or, or you help deliver stories for scientists. And, and you basically do this through filmmaking, design, website design, photography, all this kind of stuff. And obviously, this is very near and dear to my heart because, uh, you know, I'm kind of doing the same thing. But you do it in the field of, I don't know, preservation or uh, conservation. So like, I don't know, what, what ecology, I guess, right? So do you want to, I, I've kind of, kind of butchered this a little bit. Do you want to explain what you do a little bit better than I did? <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah. So my PhD is in ecology and I mean, I'm really drawn to stories about the natural world and how the world works, um, specifically non-humans, if I can do it. And yeah, the idea for Impact Media Lab really came out of going to grad school and seeing firsthand the burden that scientists have to run a lab and develop curriculum and mentor graduate students and be present as a teacher and and then sort of after all of that stuff is done, then they're also expected to be storytellers and communicators and designers, filmmakers, right? <laughs> filmmakers. Yeah. Like have a good website. Yeah. Do compelling storytelling about your work after you've, yeah, like designed experiments, run experiments, written grants, taught your class, graded your papers, mentored your grad students. Oh, yeah. If you have anything left, like do this storytelling thing because it's actually really important. And especially, you know, stories in ecology are really, a lot of the science is designed to solve, you know, huge global problems like climate change and trash and deforestation and biodiversity loss. So the storytelling is really all about influencing policy and people's actions. And it, it kind of comes at the long, you know, at the end of a long day of other stuff. So I, you know, I built Impact Media Lab to try and take some of that burden off of scientists and just say, hey, like, you just do the science and tell me about your work and we'll come up with some storytelling, you know, method and run it all for you instead. And, you know, different science lends itself to different mediums. So, you know, for, for any really cool field stuff, maybe a documentary film is the best way to tell the story. But you know, if you do theory, maybe it's animation or a museum exhibit or a podcast or, you know, we kind of we kind of do whatever makes the most sense for the science. But, you know, a lot of the goal is really just like, let us do this full time so we can do it well and, and spare you <laughs> that part of the work. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. So wait, why is this important? I mean, why shouldn't a scientist be doing science? Why do they have to have a story? Why do they like story science? What? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, how does that even, you know, how is that compatible? Yeah, exactly. Great question. You know, a lot of this, and you would know more than me because you do this kind of work, but like understanding the way the human brain works, you know, people, people are really not inspired by data. They're not inspired by information and facts. They're really inspired by characters and stories and um, stories about overcoming challenges and, you know, that emotional connection to, to what you're learning we're finding is so important. And, you know, for, for some science, if you're not trying to influence policy and behavior and, and save the world, maybe that communication isn't so important. But especially in the natural sciences, we are tackling such huge, global, complex problems. And we're really trying to find ways to live more sustainably and reverse the biodiversity crisis and, you know, do these big things. And we need the public and people on board. And so I think for a long time, we just really underestimated how much people were not inspired by science. You know, we thought like, oh, yeah, no, we just do the experiments and we we show them the numbers and, and people will change their behavior and Climate change has been the greatest case of, of, you know, social scientists actually studying and figuring out like more information does not lead to more change. If you aren't hooking people with emotional stories and connection, like it's just not the science doesn't have any impact at all. So, you know, kind of as we're learning more about like, wow, if we're going to really turn this around, we need to become storytellers and and scientists don't have time to add another job to their to their job descriptions. I guess you hook people, but what does that mean? Like, what actual physical outcomes can you know a professor or you know some some researcher have out of this? I mean, do they get do they attract higher quality talent? Do they get more grants? Are they able to speak at more conferences? Uh, what have you noticed? I mean, you you've been doing this for a while. I mean, do do you want to brag a little bit? Like, how many clients? How many documentary films you've done? Like, how many people you've worked with? A few dozen, growing all the time. I would say you know one thing that I've realized in this work is you know I think. Sometimes we we think we're starting out at, at one level and we're actually, you know, 10 steps behind. So when I started the, the work, it was thinking that we were going to be doing a lot of documentary films and targeting a lot of our communication efforts at the general public. And what I found working with scientists is that, you know, I mean, a lot of times they're we're really kind of going back to square one with communication and deciding like, what is your brand? Who is your audience? Um, what kind of stories can you tell? And so often we start with an academic audience of like, okay, you know, this is your research. Maybe you study, I've been working a lot on this insect vibrational communication project. So that's the one that's freshest in my mind. But, you know, like, okay, you study these insects that they communicate by tapping on plants and they produce these really beautiful, complex sounds that humans have never heard because... You know, it's not airborne sound, it's substrate borne sound. And so, okay, you know, let's come to this project and decide like what what is cool and universal about this. There's this really amazing discovery aspect to the project because it's this entire world of language that we've never heard or considered before. Okay, we can play with that a lot to hook the general public and just get them inspired to think differently about insects and insect communication. And, and then the project leads into how does um, climate change affect it? It kind of shuts this conversation down because things get too hot and they change the frequency of the sounds that they create. And, you know, there's kind of all this other implication stuff that we get to, but we, you know, we really had to start with like, let's just help people discover something new. And there's a lot of power in that. And it draws a lot of people to science, which of course, then you're attracting new people to STEM. And, you know, I feel like with every communication effort, you're hitting all of these important things. Are we attracting underrepresented groups to science? Are we inspiring a generation of scientific thinkers? Are we 
inspiring people to want to conserve insects and think differently about the natural world. And, you know, we do all of that through this very simple storytelling about this world of insect communication you've never heard of before. Honestly, our audience probably isn't that interested. I mean, it is interesting, but that's not why they tuned in into this uh, podcast. But but yeah, so I guess the real like physical benefits from this, like what kind of return on investment could you expect as a researcher? Oh, okay. Yeah. So as a scientist doing the communication, so even with this project, this is a good example. So we started with the grant writing. So we worked on the craft of storytelling to get the grant. So so it was the largest NSF grant that I I've had gotten. I guess it was the first big NSF grant that we got as an agency with a scientist. So it was half a million dollars to do this study on insects. So it started with like, okay, good storytelling produces a better grant, makes you more likely to get funded. Okay, this grant flew through the review process. They had zero critiques. It got funded in full the first time around. Okay, great. Now we move into the communication on the website. Like that's helped her attract students and collaborators. So yeah, we built this website about the work and about her research more broadly. And I mean, she gets, you know, she's kind of one of my good testimonials, but she gets emails every week just talking about how the site, you know, is how clear everything is, how easy to understand, how compelling, how like great it is as a reflection of who she is as a professional and her research. So, you know, it it kind of you know, you're, you're changing your credibility when you can tell your story well. And that helps you get noticed for, she's been on NPR a bunch now. And, you know, like it, it helps you get noticed. It helps you get recognition for the work. It helps you stand out as a communicator. So you get invited for speaking opportunities. Um, some of those public, like she does a lot of talks at the public library, but some of them academic with a paid you know, speaking stipend. So people will fly her all over the place to talk about this work. And, you know, sometimes you get paid for that. So I think the return on investment of good communication is, you know, not just for the public, but yeah, for, for attracting students, for attracting funding, for attracting collaborators. You know, I think anymore in academia, you you don't often stay at the same university where you first get hired. Or even if you want to argue for a promotion or something new at the university you're based at, a lot of times that's done through job offers. So you have to go somewhere else, get the offer so that you can talk to your university, your university about paying you more money, you know, so good communication helps you get more job offers, uh, which can lead to promotions at your own university or, you know, leaving to actually go to another place. So Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, that's that's pretty clear. <laughs> and and you've seen this happen with your clients though, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it happens all the time. Jeez, that's crazy. I actually didn't know that you did the the grant writing or, you know, that you were assisting with that, but I think that's huge too, like telling a story like who does it? What scientist, what researcher doesn't want to just, you know, breeze through the review process? And a lot of scientists will sort of know this intuitively because if you've ever reviewed grants, you know, or reviewed papers, just like it's such a bore so much of the time so if anything compelling comes across your desk that is designed to hook you you know I think that's what a lot of good communication is like putting the hook early not always starting with the just the biggest broadest facts and then narrowing down to like fact after fact after fact which is often how scientific writing is done if you can even be compelling in the process like Man, the second you read the proposal, it, it stands out because it's rarely done in science or the paper, you know? So, okay. So for the, the grant the grant process, I mean, you're, as you said, you kind of started out in filmmaking. You're, you're still like kind of a filmmaker at heart, like a documentary filmmaker. But I mean, obviously you can't necessarily staple a DVD to a grant proposal, right? So how do you integrate that? Is it, is it literally just like text or do you also put like animations in or images to, to really hook the person, for example, for this grant process? Um, so for the grant process, a lot of times it's just the pitching of ideas, so, so, I mean, the filmmaking is really the new, new to me. I'm, I've been in science a long time, so I feel no, more confident as a grant writer than I do as a filmmaker. <laughs> so it kind of started with, you know, like I have my PhD, I have all of this training in grant writing, 
I could bring the compelling storytelling side to the writing as well. And at least like having, I think, you know, this is kind of true of a lot of branding. It's really hard to do for yourself. So if you are the scientist, maybe you're really excited about the methods or the analysis or some like minor base pair transition that happens. And, you know, it's hard to to see the big picture. So even having someone come in, a scientist or a communicator to come in and say, actually, this is what you think is really compelling about your work, but here's this other thing. And I think it's even more compelling than that. And I think if we change the scope of the paper to really emphasize this other thing, um, the insect communication project is a good example. Like, okay, there is the excitement of the insect communication, but what's really cool about this climate change aspect was that, you know, if the frequencies change enough, the species could actually start to be attracted to a different subspecies. So like a male trying to court a female could start accidentally courting the wrong species just because of the call. And so, so, you know, coming in and saying like, actually, there's this really cool thing happening here that we could focus on about this, like, what if sexual communication starts to break down in the process? Like, yes, okay, maybe the scientist is excited about that they use laser vibrometers to record the sound, but that's not what's most compelling. What's most compelling is like, what if the system starts to fall apart? So let's reshape the proposal to focus on that. So I think even coming in as an outsider and saying, hey, this is what you think is really cool about your work, but actually this other thing is even more compelling, objectively speaking, Um Let's emphasize that. And so then, you know, in my work, we write a lot of National Science Foundation proposals, and every proposal requires a broader impact strategy. So that's where the filmmaking comes in, is we say, okay, here's this idea. And, you know, after we do the science, here is how we're going to share it with the public. We're going to do this documentary film series. We're going to do X number of films produced these types of ways. If you fund the research, you are also funding this documentary film series and this professional group is going to run it and that adds legitimacy to the whole proposal and so I think too we get you know we get great feedback from the NSF on the broader impact section because they're they're really happy to have a scientist hire a professional to run the filmmaking side because it's more legitimate that you know they can trust the product more and so the whole proposal becomes more competitive more likely to get funded because of that. Yeah, I also didn't really realize until we started getting the feedback from the NSF being like, oh, yeah, of course, like hire someone else to do it. That's a great idea. Sign off on this right now. Wait, and the the professors can do that? Like, do they have to pay it out of pocket like right away? Or do you get it like out of the potential grant that they would win later? Yep. Or uh, I mean, or because like, it could be an upfront, like it's a big investment, right? Like what, what kind of prices what kind of numbers are we talking about well so it kind of depends if you if you want help with the writing process that i have them pay out of pocket for because you know that takes weeks to months to actually craft the story and work on the writing together um you know if if it's just like hey put together a a pitch for my broader impacts that that we do for free because we have a template developed that says you know we are a woman-owned science communication agency. We have this type of following. We've seen this type of impact. Um, you know, we'll run, we'll run a documentary film project for this scientist for anywhere from 10 to $20,000 is usually the budget of film work, sometimes more, sometimes less. But so that's easy. And we do it for free because, you know, you just put together a, a template that gets inserted into grants Interesting. And okay, so maybe some people are thinking like, okay, why is this ecology person, you know, on the podcast? What the heck? Like we've, we've contaminated it, you know, we should be listening to neuroscientists and, uh, you know, electrical engineers. Do you think this is only applicable to ecology or to other fields as well? Do you think other fields are lacking in good storytelling and conveying their message? Uh, Oh, great questions. Well, I do think in neurobiology and I assume you're accessing a lot of NIH funding, National Institute of Health. And we are actually kind of petitioning the NIH to start having a broader impacts criteria in their proposal review process. 
So the NIH is a little bit unique in that they don't require it, whereas most other grants do, most other funding agencies. So I I kind of assume neurobiology and a lot of the human health stuff can be behind in their communication. I don't know. I mean, human health is different too because you have the pharmaceutical industry who is working very hard at communication. So in ecology, you know, we don't have any, there are no real patents. There's no vested interest in one solution over the other necessarily. Um, So you don't have any of the corporate communication happening. So I don't know actually if that's a good thing or a bad thing in neurobiology. Like maybe you are up against, um, you know, sharing your science in a way that may conflict with what a company says your science says. It could be more important because you're dealing with human health where there's, you know, big money on the line sometimes. I don't know enough to know, but I do know, I mean, anybody sort of science not communicated is science not done, right? If no one finds out about your findings and and what they mean and what it took for you to get there, then you may as well have not done the study at all. And I think too often we, we settle for an academic audience and call it good. Maybe in neurobiology, people are better about outreaching with the public, but I know in in a lot of science there, we're just not, you know, the, the whole academic currency is about communicating with other intellectuals and other academics so that they can repeat your study or build on your study or contradict your study. And then too often, you know, we just forget about all the other billions of people who are not scientists who actually need to know who need to know what's going on in the world and and what they can do for their mental health or, you know, or for changing the planet or. Uh, I think it's definitely necessary, you know, and, and uh, I mean, it's refreshing too, even, even for scientists, you know, to have like, to maybe get out of the weeds, get out of the data once in a while and be like, wow, that is a really impactful, I don't know, mission statement or being able to describe it. Like a lot of times I remember the the examples, I remember the analogies, you know, like, oh, this is, you know, this is just like, uh, you know, a toad or like a newt growing back a foot, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, that's a very similar process or whatever. And it's just like, oh, okay. And that's actually what ends up sticking in my mind is that analogy or that, you know, that broader thing. And then like, it's, it's almost like you can integrate, exponentiate, you know, like go up and down in level based on that and be like, okay, well, that's the base concept is, I don't know, like a newt growing back its foot. And then actually this is the, this is the signaling. This is, you know, this is how it's actually working. But yeah, it kind of conveys it in maybe let's say one phrase or one sentence. Yeah, totally. I think even, you know, one thing, I mean, I, I had kind of said that, you know, I thought we were going to start on this, like this level of the documentary film and outreaching with the public. And so often when we sit down, it's like, okay, give me your pitch. Tell me about your science in a succinct, easy to understand way. And a lot of times we have to start there first. Like scientists don't even always have that figured out. Like, oh gosh, uh, okay, let me, all right, let's start with, you know, how do we communicate your work in three sentences in a way that that makes people want to learn more. Let's start there. Okay. And then, you know, a year from now, we should be working up to a documentary film, but let's like first understand what it is about your work that excites you. I think once, you know, like you said, once we get in the weeds, it's just like, please just let me get this grant. Please let me keep my lab above water. Please let me get published this year. There isn't great time or space to step back and say, like, why do I do this? What's really cool about my work? We're so used to everyone glazing over, um, you know, but it doesn't always have to be that way. So so you do a lot of website work, too. You, you like, build lab websites. Why is that important? So that was kind of one of those things. Again, when I started the business, I thought, oh, yeah, we're going to be drowning in film work. Everybody needs a film. And then, uh, you know, I started talking to scientists and saying like, okay, great. Yeah, let's do a film. All right, where are we going to host it? How's your website? Oh, I don't have a website. Oh, you don't have a website. Okay, well, how's your social media? Oh, I'm not on social media. Like, oh, okay. All right, so essentially no one is listening to you. You have no online platform. You have no audience. Instead of making a film let's start with a website. This is kind of how the conversation went client after client before I just started doing the work myself and pitching people starting with websites, you know, at the start of the conversation, because 
if you don't, you know, I mean, if the goal of a film is to draw attention to your work, and then when people are interested in your work after watching the film and there's nowhere to go, then what's the point? You know, if you don't have a good website for them to, to go to after they've seen the film to actually learn the details and connect with you and, and engage in a, in a real way, then, then what was the point of getting them so excited? So now we start with like, okay, let's do branding and website and, and audience building as a first step. Um, you know, let's make sure you're communicating in a compelling way. And that if you attract attention, let's say we make a film and it gets featured on a Nat Geo blog or something like that's a, that's an, a best case or, you know, one of the best case scenarios, you go totally viral and then they look around for where to learn more and there's nowhere to go. Like, we're, you know, we got to make sure the foundation is there first. So I think like websites are kind of your foundation for an online audience. They can act as a hub for everything else that you do, all the films you make, all the feeds that you have on social media. But but if you don't have a good website that acts as a reservoir for all of that stuff, you know, where are people going to learn more about your work and you and where, how do they actually connect if they get excited and they want to throw money your way, which is... You know, what we all are hoping for is, is we're going to get that call that says we're going to interview you on BBC, BBC Live or we think you'd be perfect for this funding opportunity. But, you know, a film, a film will excite people, but it, it, it's not a great way to connect you. OK, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. You may be putting the cart before the horse if you're doing this kind of video stuff. So what are the steps, I guess, for, you know, building up a following or like like what would you recommend? OK, let's say a researcher or a scientist or a company wants to do this by themselves or maybe with your help. What what are the first, second, second third, you know, up to the millionth step? Yeah. So I would say like, all right, first thing we would do is like, let's get the basics of brand covered, which I know a lot of scientists do not identify with the term branding or brand, but you know, your lab, your lab is essentially a, a brand. So I would say, you know, we need to sit down and get a really concise, compelling idea of what your lab does and how it's different than other labs and what's special and unique about what you're doing. So you can download branding documents or some, you know, questionnaires that would help you get at some of these ideas. What's really compelling? How does it change science? How does it change the world? Describe, describe your lab in three adjectives, all, all of those kinds of exercises. So then you'll have a pretty good idea of like, okay, my lab does this and we're special because of this. And we're, you know, what we do is really compelling because of X, Y, and Z all right, let's get a logo together. It can be very simple, but something that goes on everything so that people can follow that like a crumb trail to get back to you. So they see the logo on your website. They see it in the talks you give. They see it in the films that you make. They see it in the papers that you produce, you know, just something to, to kind of keep it all cohesive. All right, now we have a logo. Let's do, you know, the next level would be like, if, if they have time and space, like let's get a font and some colors that, you know, are identifiable for you. So we've now like gone through the basics of branding. You have a good idea of your vision and voice. You've got your logo, you've got your colors, and we're going to use that consistently across social media and film and, and talks and all of websites and all of that. All right. Then we get the website going. That's kind of your brand come alive and, and collects all of the amazing things that you're doing. Okay. Now you've got a great website. I would say let's do a film, a short bio about your work that you can use at, on social media and at the start of every talk and that you can use to, to promote yourself. You can link to it in grants. So, you know, brand, then website, then short film, and then, you know, probably social media after that because social media is, you know, it's kind of a long haul. You have to choose a couple platforms that make sense to you or one do it well. Building an audience is sort of a long, slow process, but, but an important one. So brand, website, film, <laughs> social media. And then, and then if you can do all of those things, well, you're doing a really, really good job. And I do, when I talk to my clients, I think, you know, the time that you spend doing communication, you really have to thank yourself for doing it. It's a it's a good service. It's a valuable service. It in, improves science literacy. 
It's good for the public. So thank yourself every time you take 10 minutes to tweet or work on your website or think about a film, like make sure you're praising yourself for going above and beyond. And usually, yeah, if you've, if you've gotten through those initial steps and you've got all of that content in order, like you you're doing great. Just keep doing that. Keep your website up to date. Keep going on social media and you will get recognized and you will start to stand out just for having your communication in order. Wow. That's crazy. So what kind of timeline are we talking about? Like, let's say, let's say somebody does it perfectly. Like, like, let's say you do it. How quickly could you go from like zero to hero? Yeah. (laughs) Great question. Um, So I would say, yeah, we usually take a month for brand building. Then we take two months for building a website. Uh, Let's say we take three months for making a short documentary film and then a couple of weeks getting you on social media, building out a calendar for the year of posts, and then you know doing a lot of deep thinking about, about the audience you want to engage with in the long term. So in theory, you could get yourself up and running in a year. But you know my experience with communication is that if things don't go viral in the way that we all fantasize about, I mean... I I think when I started this too, I thought, oh, every film we make is going to go crazy on the internet, every podcast, every website, every photo. And you probably know, like, it just doesn't really work that way. The internet is a very noisy place. You can more reliably expect that it's going to take a couple years of putting in the time for people to start to notice. So I'd say, you know, plan on a three to five year timeline of like really building a fan base of people that love your work and follow everything that you write and everything that you do, every blog post that actually go download your papers. And, you know, so you can get sort of zero to there in a year. And I'd say in three years, you should be in a, you should feel like you're in a totally different place than you were when you started where you have a following and people writing to you and, and, you know, people raving about your work globally or locally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would completely agree. You know, I've been doing this podcast and another podcast as well. And it's just like, on one hand, it is disappointing. It's like, oh, I'm not like a mega billionaire, you know, downloads and everything like this. But at the same time, it is really rewarding because you do get feedback and that feedback is way more impactful than, you know, seeing a million on your downloads list. And so it's it's really amazing. Like you you can build up a following very quickly. And uh, again, you don't need to be Gangnam Style. You don't need to have a billion downloads. You can just really impact the few dozen people that you want to impact and I guess sway their mind. And that makes all the difference. That'll make a much bigger difference than, you know, doing Gangnam Style. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I think, you know, when we start down the branding process, it, you know, we have to be realistic that science is, especially, you know, neurobiology or ecology. I mean, these are very niche, niche interests. So we're not doing, we're not appealing to everyone. And so let's be realistic about that to start. Um, I cannot remember who founded the concept of a thousand true fans. Yeah, Kevin Kelly, I think. Yeah, he's saying basically a thousand true fans is all you need to have a uh, living. If, if you're a band and you have a thousand people that are willing to, you know, travel two hours to come see you perform and spend, I think it was uh, like sixty dollars per per year on you, then that's a living right there. That's that's a that's a profession, I guess. Exactly, and yeah, I mean, if you can get a thousand people who read your science, everything that you do and get excited about your work and share it with their friends. Like that's, that's a great rewarding, like valuable thing to do with your time. Um, We don't need a million people to, to feel like what we're doing is important. And it's always going to be, you know, I do think in the communication, in the communication world, like you will be surprised the numbers that you see compared to say citations or downloads of your scientific papers. You know, we, the first film we made, I was very disappointed because, you know, we had 800 views the first week or whatever. And I thought, Oh, 800, like, you know, we all expected like, Oh, it's going to be millions and millions and millions. But then we could step back and say like, well, how many people downloaded the paper? It's like 30, you know, 
So even I, I do think communicating for the public, maybe it doesn't go viral. Maybe you get a thousand people who watch it, but still like that's really good compared to how many people actually read the paper, let alone just, just opened the paper at all. You know, and, and we can kind of feel good about that. I mean, they're they're different audiences, but it's still. Yeah, that, that's actually my pitch for a lot of the guests, you know, coming on uh, this podcast is like, you're probably going to get more views. You're probably going to get more listens than, you know, your biggest paper. <laughs> and, you know, it's crazy. And then uh, again, also, if you're thinking about if you're talking to an audience, I mean, think about talking to an audience of 800 people. That's in, that's insane. That's like that's like life goals right there. You know, like imagine all those people in front of you, you know, so that's not even that's not even nothing to laugh at. You know, that, that's a lot. So Kika, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention? Believing in believing in the power of your work, it's really easy to get disappointed as a scientist. Like, you know, nine out of 10 grants are going to get rejected. Most of your papers are going to get rejected the first time around. Like, you know, it's a can be a tough business to be in. And it's easy to start to feel like what you're doing doesn't matter. But there is always something compelling that attracted you to the questions that you're pursuing. And so, yeah, seek outside help from communicators or just friends. If you can get, especially if they're in marketing, um, to sit down and help you think through, like, what are the big ideas in your work? They may be different than what you expect. You know, what what is really compelling about what you do? You know, it's in there for everybody, every every scientist. You wouldn't live this life if you weren't really drawn to your questions. So tapping into you know what it is that keeps you coming back every day. A, you'll find it really rewarding, but B, you I think you'll be surprised how much if you can tap into that that compelling story in your work, how much it can change your career and your success with with proposals and papers and, and recruiting students and all of that stuff. So it's worth the time it takes. It does take time, but but it's worth it. Definitely. Like if you can't do a science communicator, then then ask your friend, like you said, well, that's assuming your friends, you have friends, right? But uh, that's that might be a big assumption for some scientists. <laughs> <laughs> but Kika, this has been excellent. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for coming on and explaining the importance of communication in science. Yeah, thank you. everyone i thought that was really good and uh you know we were talking later and it's just like well you know one person one professor you know stood up and objected at one of her talks like hey you should teach scientists how to you know communicate and how to tell how to do storytelling on their own you know like this isn't something that people should contract out and i mean you know that is true like you should know about this but at the same time you know this is your career this is your life that we're talking about and so the same way you wouldn't necessarily represent yourself in court you know with like your life on the line with you potentially needing to go to jail or pay a huge fine or something like this if that happens i'm not saying that would happen to you because you know all my listeners are you know law abiding people and it's really good but you know, you wouldn't necessarily do that or or a car mechanic. Like, you don't necessarily always fix your car because, again, your life is on the line. If you mess up, if you forget to, you know, put in the wrong screw, you could die. You could just, like, your wheels fall off in the middle of the freeway and it's just like, oh, you know, and there, there was a bridge, you know, and, and, a, and a bus full of nuns or something like that, just making the situation as bad as possible. So... You know, you you kind of you outsource this stuff. And that's that's why we do live in a society. That's why we do have this kind of system where people specialize in different things. You know, so you have cooks, you have, you know, restaurant owners, you have street sweepers, you know, people that do all these different things that are professionals in these different things. So you can trust them and their work. And they're probably going to do better work than you would have done if you would have just, you know, watched a YouTube video and, and uh, done it yourself, you know. So uh, let somebody who's a car mechanic uh, work on your car. So I think this is, you know, very, very important. And this is kind of goes in with my announcement for this episode. I actually am going to be taking my company, Neural Implant Media, out of stealth mode. So probably known, like maybe if you've met me at a conference or something like this, I do a lot of media services. So podcasting, video services, I do this for companies, organizations, you know, whatever, societies, anything like this. And, uh, you know, been, been kind of building that up, figuring everything out. And uh, yeah, so now I'm announcing it on this podcast is that I am open for service and I'm officially, I'm, I'm public now. So if you are 
part of an organization or company or society that needs some kind of media service, you know, be it, again, podcasting is my specialty, but also video work, whether it be like filming, you know, a conference or a panel or making a promotional video, making like a mini documentary, describing your work, graphic design, illustration, animation, even even stuff like, you know, putting together events. Like I can help you do that. Being able to throw together that event that's really just like awesome and people will talk about for years and people will remember for years and when people will remember you and your society and your company your organization whatever it may be they will remember that for years and you know as, as for putting together grants uh yeah we'll see i mean let, let us know and, and uh, craft a good story for your grant because again as kika was saying is if you have a good story, it'll just breeze through. There won't even be a review process because, or there'll be a review process. It'll breeze through the review process. That's what I meant to say. Because having a good story, having good, a good why is the most important thing that you ha- you can do. It's important. <laughs> and, and you know, me and Kiko were talking later. It's like, I was like, well, academia is is kind of it's not subject to market forces. It's 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 kind of in this own little bubble, and so it doesn't have to have customers. And she's like, no, 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 not at all. It is, and you are selling something. You're constantly pitching something. You are a startup. You are constantly pitching for more money and uh, asking for more new money, trying to sell your research. And so you're absolutely subject to market research, but you just don't know it, and you just don't know that you've been playing a game very badly. <laughs> and so that's what. Neural implant media is all about is let's help you play this game well. And the the best part is everybody's playing so badly that you play even like mildly well. And, you know, and then you're just completely uh, way, way ahead of everybody. Like one of my favorite quotes is in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. So let's let's give you one eye and, uh, you know, you can uh, kill it. And within a year, you know, you really leaps and bounds ahead of where you were and uh, where you or your company or your organization was. And uh, I think it's going to be great. So check it out. Neural Implant Media. The website is neuralimplant.media. And, uh, you know, either write me on this, uh, neuralimplantpodcast at gmail.com, or my other email for Neural Implant Media, ladan, L-A-D-A-N, at neuralimplant.media. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you guys and potential collaborations because my customers so far have been happy. They, they've really enjoyed it and they're just like, wow, getting this message out is really, really important. And there's nothing better than telling a story well and feeling success from that, like getting success from that. Because again, you are pitching every day. You are a startup that is pitching your idea and you're always trying to raise money. And so... If you look at it like that, then it's very, very simple. Having a good pitch deck, having a good presentation, having a good, you know, branding, having a good story, which is the most important thing. Having a good story is is invaluable. There's literally nothing better that you could do for your career and your life and your organization and your business. So check it out. Neural Implant Media. Okay. Hopefully you found this enjoyable. Hopefully you learned something new and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.